So let's talk about GMOs for a minute because I think that's gonna illustrate another part of the problem that's important. I don't wanna spend a lot of time in it. There's a lot of information online in my book and the books that other speakers at the conference have had here about the myths of GMOs. But it's very important to understand that most of what you're told in public relations and in the media, as a journalist, I can say this with certainty, is not true. Very seldom. So you here at the, this conference are very lucky to be able to get accurate information and good science about the truth about GMOs. So I'm gonna pull back the, the veil that sort of covers this. I, I mentioned this last night and somebody said they appreciated it, so I'll repeat it. And that is, is that as a journalist, I know what happens in the newsrooms. And what happens is these public relations documents get on the journalist's desk and they're just repeated. They're not evaluated, they don't do any research. You're just getting what the companies are telling you. You're not getting independent reporting anymore. Journalism has basically abandoned that obligation. Genetically engineered foods. It's an industrial product for an industrial system. These are agrochemical companies. If you remember one thing about GMOs, remember it's all about these chemical companies and the chemicals that they use either they engineer a plant to withstand being sprayed repeatedly by herbicides, toxic herbicides, or they put the insecticide into the plant itself. So when you eat them, you're eating not only genetic constructs, which have been untested and are unstable, you're also getting the residues of the pesticides on the plants, or you're getting the insecticide itself because it's been genetically engineered to constantly be active in that plant. When you spray a pest, an insecticide, it can, it can degenerate, okay, and our, our, you know, you might, you might use them in your home and garden, I hope you don't, but you know, it, it, you, you do have a time period when it goes away. Genetically engineered insecticidal plants don't. They, they're engineered to stay active constantly and in all parts of the plant, the leaves, the seeds, the, um, uh, in the roots, in the soil, it's still alive. The process is unstable, they don't know what they're doing, they, um, there is precision when they select the, uh, the genetic constructs that they want to use, but once they put together a little cassette of all these designer genes and they insert it into the plant, they use a gun, 22 caliber gun, or they use a, um, a, a virus or bacteria to insert it in. So it's kind of a violence in itself. They have no idea where it goes in the genome. I've seen pictures of mutations and, and plants that have been genetically engineered, the ones that get discarded, that are horrifying. And um, the way they know if it worked is they use an antibiotic resistant marker. So you're getting antibiotic resistant genes in your food as well. That's a problem and they're in the environment and they're in the waterways. Um, they use that and they put an antibiotic on it, like tetracycline or streptocycline, one of the anti general antibiotics. And if, the, and if the plant still survives, the genes survive, they go, oh, okay, that's a gene that's working. And then they grow thousands and thousands of them out. And if it looks like corn and acts like corn and walks like corn and talks like corn, it must be corn. And they do this purposefully. They discard thousands and thousands of these experiments and then they clone the one that looks and acts the way it's supposed to. So it's all accidental. They just hope for the best thing. One out of 10,000 will work, and they clone that, and they turn that into their product. And when they talk about there's the most studied in the world, they're talking about this, this other aspect of it. And not, once it's been cloned and ready to go to market, they don't pay attention to how it affects you and your health. They don't, affect, they don't pay any attention to what happens in the environment when it's being grown out. None of that is of consequence. Never been tested, never been studied when they were first, when they were first marketed. And um, I was involved with this issue right at that time in the, in the 1994, 1995 time period. And we said, no, 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 you can't do this. Nature has a way of responding to these threats. They're gonna, they're, you're you're going to be able to have insects that will have resistance to this Bt corn. You're going to have weeds that will be um, resistant to the herbicides. And we're going to have super weeds. And now, in fact, all of these things have come true. And I just want to mention, because I'm a farmer advocate, that these companies restrict the use of these seeds and use of these chemicals. And as was mentioned last night, farmers don't buy seeds anymore. They rent them. 
They only get them for a year. They can't save any of the seed. They're restricted by these contracts. And if they don't obey all the terms of these very complicated contracts, they're sued by the agrochemical companies. Monsanto sues hundreds of farmers for contract infringements. You're, they've even sued farmers when, when their genes contaminate their, their fields. So it's a very oppressive system of control that's taken over agriculture. Now, one of the biggest dangers of genetically modified organisms is the fact that they are mark they're, they're made to withstand herbicides. It, the most common is glyphosate or Roundup. According to um, Chuck Benbrook, who's the former agriculture chair of the National Academy of Sciences, genetically engineered crops increase the use of herbicides by 122 million pounds, a 15-fold increase between 1994 and 2004. They reduce the prices of these so farmers would buy them. And um, they kept increasing the amount that was being used because the more glyphosate, the more herbicide you use, the more seeper weeds you have, the more resistance you have, and then the stronger chemicals. It's a perfect system when you think about it. You get to sell more and more and more and more of your product. And now, because there's so many super weeds and weeds that are resistant to glyphosate, they're saying, let's use 2,4-D, dicamba, and other, other to more toxic chemicals to control these. This is what they call the pesticide treadmill. It's a trap. There are biological solutions to weeds and pests that are perfectly effective, that have been used and proven by science. So this is not the agriculture that we want. It has enormous consequences for the environment and our personal health. In terms of seeds, so this is another, this is another slide to show the rise of super, super weeds and the rise of use of pesticides on GE crops. And in terms of seeds, these colorful seeds are treated with pesticides. So it's not only in the plants, it's not only sprayed on everything, they, they treat the seeds themselves. And most of these are treated with nicanoids, these uh, very powerful new uh, hormone disrupting toxic chemicals that are killing the bees. Again, we have now also new studies which are showing the monarchs because the milkweed has been, their food supply has been wiped out by GM agriculture. So again, we have not only this in our own bodies, but in the body of the earth. You know, all around us, we're losing biological diversity, both from the monocropping farming practices and the use of these chemicals. You know about colony collapse disorder? It's much worse now. And part of it is this overuse of these um, toxic chemicals. It just gets worse. <laughs> there's, there's so many sources of these chemicals and, and genetics in our diets and in the food system now. Uh, I wanna just focus on, I focus on cereals in one company that should know better. Um, because sugar is, is a big part of the American, the standard American diet. And uh, now 50% of sugar, or fit, almost 60 now, 60% 60 of sugar consumed in the United States comes from sugar beets. This is, this is a technology that's only a few years old. Roundup Ready sugar beets are now used so, to create the sugar, sugar supply in this country. And when, uh, when the sugar beet GMO, mostly Monsanto, went to get approval for their sugar beets, and I'll talk about this approval process in a second, but when they went to get it, they went behind the scenes and were able to get a 5,000 increase, 5,000% 5, increase in the residues on the sugar beets of glyphosate. So for a while there, there was a certain level of glyphosate that was allowed in the residue on the foods you eat, but not sugar. Sugar is now 5,000 times more. And for when they use the parts of the sugar beet that don't go into sugar manufacturing, the tolerance is even greater for the, um, the amounts, for the residues that they use in animal feed. So the animals are being poisoned even more than ourselves. And again, the fields where Roundup is used are deprived of life. Birds, insects, the microbes in the soil, they're all being doused with these toxic chemicals. I'm sorry to tell you, but it's getting even worse. 
Sorry? What other cereals? What other cereals? We'll get to Q&A in a little bit, so yes. The, but the corn flakes, obviously it's GMO corn, right? It's the frosted corn flakes, GMO sugar on the GMO corn. It's pretty bad. Not that you'd eat them. I know you're health advocates, so you wouldn't eat that, would you? But people do, don't they? <laughs> so now we have this technology that allows a certain level of control over nature. And whoopee, let's, con let's, let's use it on everything is sort of the idea. One of the things you need to understand about biotechnology are patents are the lifeblood of biotechnology. I've mentioned how nature is very generous. It provides for us in all the ways to cope with drought and all the problems and pests. All right, we already have this, we have the information and we have this natural response of the planet to helping us uh, in a healthy way. But we take, the, the genetic engineers take these genes out of the natural world and put them into these products. And, they, and the reason they use genetic engineering instead of natural breeding is because you can patent it. They can own it. They can control the marketplace. Okay, so, so they're taking animals, fish, trees, insects. They're recombining genes from all different species to find different products to put on the market with all the same consequences that I've been talking about. I also want to mention that it's not just genetic engineering technology that you should be concerned about. We also now have synthetic biology. So genetic engineering is the recombination of species a bacteria or a uh, you know, fish gene and a strawberry, which if you're a vegan, you should be concerned about um, because now you're gonna have fish and animal products in your veg. But <clears throat> they recombine what is existing in nature already. Synthetic biology, did you know that you can order DNA on the online? You can order artificially created organisms? It's all very easy now to do. So they, in synthetic biologists basically create a whole new life form. And now it's in your food supply. There's synthetic vanilla, which is going to put the traditional vanilla farmers out of business. Okay, instead of supporting agriculture and the culture of agriculture, these technologists would rather sell you a product. Let's talk about nanotechnology. These are very, very tiny, tiny particles. They're in sunscreens. Did you know that? When you put them on their skin, they go all through your body. They can go through. It's not like when you eat something. You know, it goes through your digestive system. These things move around in your body through your organs. And there's been a serious concern about nanoparticles in the liver. So there's now nano, nanotechnology in the food supply. And the USDA just approved spending almost $4 million to promote nanotechnology. And in the case of both synthetic biology and nanotechnology, there's no labeling. They haven't been tested for safety. And there's no right for the consumer to say, we don't want this in our food supply. But this is what we're facing now. I want to talk for a second about trees, because um, genetically engineered trees are very important here in the southeast. Do you know the loblolly pine? It's planted around here uh, very much. It's uh, one of the most productive sources of, uh, of uh, pulp for paper. And it's planted in tree plantations. So Arbor Gen, which is, a, which is a company here in the South, has um, genetically engineered many trees. This is their catalog here. And um, the problem is most of them are being genetically engineered to, um, to be Roundup resistant, by the way. But trees are a whole different dynamic. And you talk about it because we've been talking about annual crops that get harvested, right? And, and, they, and they only last a year. These trees, they're sitting out there for 40 years exuding the GMO pollen year after year after year, impacting the soil, impacting the wildlife, impacting water. And pollen is a common allergy, right, for a lot of people. One study done on the long-distance dispersal of pollen in the spring showed that there were millions of pounds of pollen given off from these pine trees, and it can travel 1,800 miles. They've also find viable, found viable pollen 2,000 feet in the air. So how will this GM pollen affect human health and the environment? Again, the USDA approved genetically engineered trees, these particular pines, rubber stamped them, 
and they're being allowed to be planted here. So let's look up for a second. Are genetically engineered organisms being regulated or not? As a former USDA lawyer, I can say they're not. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about how that happened. But basically, the basic premise that you need to understand, because the industry tries to tell you they're safe, and this slide shows you that everybody, there's this finger pointing going on, okay? Where the industry says, no, 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 the government's proving it. And the government says, no, 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 the industry's, the industry's responsibility. But it's a voluntary system. So the USDA or the FDA or the EPA, those are the three agencies that are involved, they're only told what the industry tells them. There's no independent analysis. There's nothing going on that says, that ever questions what the industry tells them. So how did this happen? <sighs> Several key components are bad legal decisions. The courts have pretty, are pretty much biologically illiterate. So they're just rubber stamping, again, what the industry tells them. There's been the capitulation of old scientists, and from my point, standpoint, one of the worst problems is a, a complacent media who never questions what they're told about these products and this information. But one, one, one moment, and I go over all these stories in my book, I talk about a very important decision that the U.S. Supreme Court made okaying the patenting of the living organisms. You're not supposed to have patents on life forms. Come on, that just violates common sense as well as the whole idea of what patents were originally created to, to do for us, which was to protect our creativity. No, you don't patent life. But how'd that happen? Well, a key decision in the Supreme Court was made by Clarence Thomas, who was a former Monsanto lawyer. He should have recused himself. But the industry was very clever. They brought a case by Pioneer, DuPont, rather than Monsanto, so he didn't have to recuse himself, and he could be the deciding judge to patent life forms. There are many other uh, decisions by the Supreme Court and other courts that have validated this, this corruption that, that we've been talking about. But the, the, the story that really stands out in my mind was in 1986, four Monsanto executives went to the White House when Reagan was president, and sat down and they created the regulatory system we have. And basically what they said, they all agreed, it's called the Coordinated fr uh, Framework. It was announced um, later when George Bush, who was vice president at the time, um, became president, George I. When he became president, his vice president then carried out this deregulatory program. And they said there were gonna be no new laws. So even though this is a revolutionary science, Sorry, I always say it's not science. Revolutionary technology, changing everything. There wouldn't be any new laws governing it. And there wouldn't be any new science. So we're using science based on chemicals to evaluate the impact of genetics on these living organisms. And this was a deal that was made with industry. They left just enough regulation in place. You know the story about the lights are on, but nobody's home? That's what you need to think about with these agencies. They, it appears and it makes the, the industry say, oh, there's something going on, but it's not. 